Okay, in this tutorial what we're going to do is we're going to go through the uh, initial fundamentals of lighting. So going through the uh, basic lighting features within 3ds Max 8. Um, and then we'll go through to, uh, go through using the standard lights to simulate a strip lighting system, an area light which you can't natively do with the standard lights. So just going through the actual lighting features that we've got, uh, they've each got pretty much the same kind of setup apart from these mental array ones obviously. So if we just start off with the basic spotlight, uh, we can literally go through all these features and then they'll kind of juxtapose across to the rest of these uh, additional lights here, not the skylight though. So if we just create a uh, target spot in the front viewport. Now obviously we're not seeing anything in the viewport yet because I don't have any objects in there so I'm just going to quickly create a plane primitive and then first off you can see a basic throw of uh, the lights ranges. So just by clicking that I'm going to increase the amount of segments just so we can see in the viewport the throw of the light. Okay, so if you notice that the uh, the fall off is very very tight, so we've got very very little fall off here, which represents here in the viewport as well. So let's just go through all these parameters here. So I'll just pull this out, and we can obviously go through all the parameters. So obviously we can turn the light on and off. We can change its type from directional, uh, some from spot to directional and omni. Obviously, we'll go through those in a second. Uh, we can say whether it's targeted or not, which literally turns this target on, on, or, on or off. So we can either rotate it when it's not targeted, and if it is targeted, we obviously have to use this target point here to position the light. Back in the light, we've obviously got different types of shadows. By default, it's off, so. We've got various different types, advanced ray traced, metal ray shadow maps, obviously used within metal ray rendering mm -hmm. engine. Airy shadows, which simulates uh, well, area lights, to be honest. Uh, shadow maps, which are the most commonly used, and ray trace shadows. Um, the main difference between these are, well, the main difference we'll actually like use is uh, the shadow map and the ray trace ones. Shadow maps do not uh, generate transparent shadows based on object opacity. So, for example, in the material editor, if we have a uh, material that is say for example uh, semi-transparent as we've got here the shadow cast by that if we assign this to let's quickly just drop in a teapot in there and if I assign well if we just render it out as is for the minute we'll see that the shadow is black because our object is totally opaque now if we assign this same uh, material, this material here, this semi-transparent -trans material here to the object and then render it out again we'll notice that even though the object is semi-transparent our shadow is still totally black now shadow maps are basically an image based solution so it doesn't work out uh, transparencies so if we actually change this to ray traced and render it out the shadow is now transparent accordingly so that's the main difference between the two um, okay let's just go back into shadow maps and then we'll carry on through here um, I'll just put this back to a standard material I'm just going to give it a little bit of specularity so we can see some of the, the light properties and effect let's put that up to full screen as well okay um, next, next rollout intensity, color, and attenuation. We've got a multiplier setting, which obviously is the intensity of the light. Normally, you wouldn't really want to put the multiplier value above one. Reason being is because any color that you assign to the light would get washed out. So, if I increase that to say three it literally kind of gets blown out on the specularity and this gets overly saturated so normally what we do if we have like a um, if we want a value of two for example for some bizarre reason um, we'd normally do two versions of one and then just instance the light so if whatever value we change to one we change it automatically does it across to the other so we get a better uh, color range so let's just undo that okay Obviously, we've got the multiplier color next to it. 
so we can obviously change the color of the light depending on the type of mood that you want to go through so if you want to like simulate a kind of like a, a daylight bulb so we've got a slightly blue color here um let's just put that back to white okay next thing we've got is the decay now by default we don't have any decay so therefore this light's intensity will carry on all the way down through the scene all the way to infinity so it will carry on going all the way down here with the same throw so we've got this large throw that's coming off uh, all the way down to the to uh, infinity so this is normally used uh, we normally we normally either use one or the other. We either normally use none, no decay whatsoever. And if you want to want to control any decay, we can use attenuation, which obviously fades the light intensity off over distance, or we use inverse square. Now we don't really use inverse decay all that much. Um, reason being is it doesn't give like a. Um, it's it's almost the same as actually using attenuation. So it's using attenuation if, uh, is normally better and easier to control than using a standard inverse decay. Now inverse square, if you notice, as soon as I turn that on, the uh, the light representation in the viewport's gone virtually black. Now that's the reason being is because this start value, which is here uh, is saying that the light is only this amount of units large so to actually get any intensity within the scene I need to crank up this multiply now this is the only time you should really crank up the, mul the multiply value uh, beyond uh, a value of one so if I now render this out actually let's put this closer to the surface you can see a nicer type of fall off uh, just bring that in I'm just going to ditch that teapot as well. So if I render that out, we see a nicer, more realistic fall off. So we've got a nice strong intensity here, which gradually, which which fades away quite steeply. So what we've got in essence, if I come back in here and I just draw out exactly what we've got. Again, this was all covered in the uh, in the workshop, if you can remember it for so long ago. So what we've basically got is uh, with the um, linear decay and any other attenuation that we use we've got like a graph which the decay is kind of like that it's basically if you imagine that's intensity and that's distance so we're getting further away and that's the highest that's the that's the, that's the multiply value of one up there and that's the value of zero and distance value of zero so at value at uh, distance value of zero our intensity is at one and our distance value of um, let's say feet up, um the um, uh, strength value uh, gradually goes down to zero now what inverse square does uh, inverse square decay looks like this so we've got a very very steep fall off uh, which then gradually uh, levels out. Now the thing is that this value here never reaches zero. So what we basically have to do is we have to go through and use attenuation to tell the light this is the zero value. This is where we need to stop. So we can basically pull that out to there. So therefore Max doesn't need to calculate any further distance. It doesn't need to work out the light for, the, for you know, through into infinity. Otherwise it might take a little bit longer to calculate if you've got a lot of lights in the scene. So that's inverse square decay. It gives a more realistic representation of light fall off. So I'm just going to put that back to none. Uh, and you can see straight away that the light's gone very, very intense. Okay. I'm also going to put that color back to white as well. Okay, and drop that back down to one. Right, next. Um, the best way to represent this is I'm going to show you uh, the attenuation using a volumetric light because it gives us uh, a better visual representation of uh, how attenuation works. So I'm just going to ditch that plane and I'm going to reposition this guy in the front viewport then go to perspective so the reason we go to perspective is, is that volumetrics don't really work in um, standard orthogonal uh, views they mainly work in perspective views so I'm just going to go to environment uh, let's pull up actually uh, let's just add a 
volumetric light effect and then we'll set up our volumetric light in there which is obviously automatically assigned our spotlight in there so if I just quickly render this out we can see that if I just move this out of the way let's just shift that across to the side and render that out again and I'm just going to bring that bar in so we can see exactly what we're dealing with now let's start with near attenuation so obviously to enable it we need to click on use so what this basically does near attenuation fades in the light strength so we're starting let's start it at a value turn that off turn that start it at a value of you can see in the viewport our ranges so we can see this fading in so this is obviously starting from here this is a value of like 56.26 what we've got here let's just obviously change it to 60 so it's a nice round number uh, and that fades in up to the value of 80 so we're going from 60 here to about 80 around this region here so that uh, near attenuation fades the light intensity in. and what far attenuation does we'll just turn that off and then enable this this fades out the late the light strength so we should have a fall off uh, sorry a um, uh, a reduction in light attenuate uh, light uh, intensity from this value here which is roughly around about 180 to this region here which is about 340 so there we go so combined what we can do is we can create some pretty cool light effects this is normally useful if for example you want like a volumetric haze effect uh, and you don't want the internal parts of like I say for example you've got a light bulb model here and you don't want it internally lit you don't want this kind of volumetric effect inside it so you would basically design the uh, the bulb here um, and then you'd have your light um, uh, volumetrics or light attenuation kicking off on the outside okay I'm just going to turn this volumetric effect off let's just get rid of it don't need it anymore and I'm going to kill those as well okay next property is the spotlight parameters now uh, these are just basic um, display properties and um, how you actually design the uh, the spotlight itself what's its what its main properties are so I'm just going to go and create another plane so we can see what we're doing and let's just shift that across there and I'm going to reposition that as before let's put that more on the piss okay uh, firstly is show cone now these this is basically just an option to see the the throw of the cone in the viewport when you don't have it selected so if I select off we don't see the cone select it click on that we've got it viewed at all times so this is normally useful to turn on or off if you need to see how how the the cones throw or the the, the decay is visible in the viewport if you've got multiple lights in there if you've got like about 50 lights in there and you've got them all the cones visible then you might want to turn it off because the scene might get quite overcrowded um, when you're uh, working with additional assets um so if i just render that out as is we've got literally the resulting uh throw on the uh, on the plane object overshoot now this is uh quite important to remember now what overshoot does if i if i click it you'll notice straight away that outside of the throw area uh we've got full uh illumination so what that does straight away is that disables the hotspot beam feature because we don't have any any um, fall off between the center point which, are, which is just this area here so this is designing the decay by tweaking this hotspot beam feature uh, by clicking overshoot that is grayed out because we don't have any decay now the entire scene if we use attenuation until at a specific point or if we don't use attenuation or decay it goes through to infinity um, is totally illuminated now the reason this fall off field value is still applicable is basically because the if I just quickly skip advanced effects and go straight down to shadow uh, map parameters sorry um, our shadow is contained within this 
throw area. So if I create a teapot and then literally just position it and render there, actually let's just scoot that across a little bit further. You'll notice that part of the teapot is only being rendered. It's actually going to be more visible if I actually just... This is useful when the fall-off cone is visible. <laughs> so I'm just going to bring that forward and then just take that to the side. So you can see that only part of the shadow, even though it's still totally illuminated, only part of the shadow is actually visible. So this is normally used for uh, if you want your shadows to be contained within a certain area uh, so you don't want to over render the size of your shadow maps now I'll cover that in a second okay I'm just going to turn overshoot back off and let's go back into the shadow beam sorry the, the hotspot beam feature now this obviously can dictate mood so therefore we want to create a um, a type of light throw which is similar to these uh, IES lights in the way that we can actually design a, um, a type of beam and type of intensity how we actually want the light to look so we can obviously create a larger throw which obviously increases the area that the shadow map needs to fill so the shadow map is obviously being stretched to fill that area Okay, next thing is uh, the type of light that we're actually throwing. So we can either have circle, which is on by default, or we can have rectangle. Normally, rectangle is best for if you're using projector lights. Uh, say, for example, you want to create a stained glass window effect or a gobo effect, that kind of thing. So if you want to give the illusion that a tree, the light is being cast from behind a tree, you can basically stick a... Um, uh, a map in here like a white and black map so white areas obviously be illuminated areas black areas wouldn't uh, and then you'd project it through this uh, rectangular shaped light and they can even um, get it to stretch its dimensions so it's proportional to the actual size of the bitmap otherwise you might get like a, a squished tree effect um, next area just put that back to circle next area is the advanced effects uh that obviously is just generally uh to do with light contrast so if i just render out a quick default one there then let's just crank up the contrast you can see it's a, it gets a little bit more intense so you can see uh a greater just scoot in there a greater um uh increase amount of contrast around the edge here, so if I just kill that back to zero, render that out, you'll see a more graduated effect. And if we increase the contrast, it increases around the edges here, the, the sharpness of it. Okay, next thing, if I just put that up to about, yeah, put it up to about 50, I'll render that out. Now the next thing is soften diffusion edge, which is basically this area here. So even if we've got a contrast high up, we can increase the diffusion edge which kind of spills over a little bit just to break it up so we can have the best of both worlds we can have a high contrast and we can also have a slightly more diffused edge to it as well um, these are uh, properties within the light so we've got diffuse specular or ambient tone ambient 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 only sorry um, that is normally more apparent if I assign this material render this out I'm going to just increase the specular level on here to make it a bit more visible and then if I go back and select the light what I can do if I just put that back to normal and render that out okay I can turn off any individual property of this light say for example i don't want a specular highlight from emitting from this light i can basically just turn this off and this illuminated area here this light area here is just in the diffuse channel now this is handy if i am simulating multiple lights which we're all doing in another tutorial uh basically to simulate um illumination from a uh illumination from the sky so we have multiple lights situated around 
the uh, our focus, our main object. So we've got multiple lights all pointing in to our center object. Now, if we have specular highlight on every single one, then we're going to have like loads of little dots all over the teapot, which is going to look strange. It's going to look like it's got the measles or something. So that is uh, obviously um, a time when we'd actually want to turn specular highlight off for these particular lights. Okay, um, diffuse, you might want to turn the diffuse channel off and just have the specularity. So for example, if you want to intensify the specular highlight for some reason, or if you just want to just a basic shineless effect or glint on the side of an object and not actually have it um, uh, illuminated in the diffuse channel, just to give it like a hair light. Okay, uh, next option is ambient only. Now, ambient light is something that is spills back from the uh, the old Max days and the and the the late you know, the late DOS days, that kind of thing. Um, so you don't really want to use ambient lighting. That basically just affects this color slot here and this value here. Now they are locked in a, in the material but you very very rarely need to use it. I wouldn't worry about that to be honest. Uh, again as before projector map we can basically have like a projector uh, image being cast across so we can just quickly just demonstrate that. So we can use any of these um, procedural uh, materials sorry ma uh, map to procedural maps or we can use one that's custom um, a bitmap map or anything else let's just grab the first one that we come across and then we can just drop that in the instance across render it out and then we get a nice tiger light effect casting across our object like i say these are normally used for like gobo effects to simulate um trees cast uh, tree shadows cast into our scenes just to give it a little bit of extra depth and a bit of extra light. Okay, next property, uh, next rollout is the shadow parameters. Um, this is normally to do with uh, shadow density, shadow color, that kind of thing. So let's render this out. I'm just going to put this up so we get a nicer area. And I'm also going to increase throw so we can see our plane a lot more clearly okay so I think I'll also change the color of this so we can see our there we go so we can see any color change that we make okay so Object shadow color, we can obviously change that. So this is obviously going to affect this color here. So we can obviously change the color of the shadow. We can obviously give it a map as well if you we really want to. So let's give it a you know quick check one. Obviously we want to change the properties of this. We obviously need to drag it into the material editor, which we can then just increase the tiling if we want to and then just render it out so we can see we've now got like a little checker effect as our shadow so again this can be used to fake in uh, various other objects like we can use like a black and white image to simulate a shadow that's being cast off scene uh, light affects shadow color so therefore if we tint the actual light it's obviously going to tint the, uh, the shadow as well so if I just let's just put this back to black and then let's make this purple Gonna leave that, turn that off. Let's just clear that out of the way. So we're back to normal, apart from the actual main multiply color is now purple. Turn that on, render that out, and we've got a little bit of a different hue here. Okay, atmosphere shadows. Uh, that's mainly to do with uh, any atmospherics like for example fogging or uh, volumetric fogs uh, that can actually uh, by enabling this this increases render time somewhat but it what it enables us to do if we've got like a volumetric effect in here like for example a volumetric fog 
we can actually use that to uh, cast shadow. So we get some kind of like a, um, a shadow from a cloud, for example, if we create like a, a little gizmo and position that here, this will actually cast a rudimentary shadow on the surface. It won't self shadow, it won't, so, it won't shadow itself. So it looks like an actual self shadow cloud. It will just cast a shadow on the ground with that kind of cloud shape. Okay, let's just put this back to white. Now the next one is one of the most important uh, features within the lights. Now this is kind of juxtaposed right across all types of light um, features. And that is these three main parameters here. Firstly, the bias. Now the bias is the distance of the shadow between the, 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 the tightest area and the actual shadow casting object. So if I render this out, oop, I have still got something enabled in here and that's the fogging. So I can just get rid of that. Let's render that out again, there we go. Now you'll see if I increase the bias, it's actually gone off scene. It's gone so much it's gone off scene. So let's give that another go increase it we can see that the distance between the bottom of the shadow casted object is looking like it's now detached from the teapot it actually gives the impression that the teapot is now hovering above the surface now there's very very little time you'll actually need to use this but the default value of one is normally a little bit too high especially if you have your lights at a, a quite a distance they can cause problems so i normally tend to drop it down to like a, a pretty low value. You never really want to put it at zero because uh, it can cause some artifact problems if your lights are a great distance away. Now, if I re-render this out, you'll see that the shadow gets put back, but you will notice that we do have some issues around this area here. This is basically because the shadow throw is quite large this actual large cone here is what our shadow mac value of 512 so it's 512 pixels is being stretched around this throw area here which is obviously quite a large area for just one single teapot so what we'd need to do is we can either if i render that out and then if i tighten this if i bring this in We'll see the shadow quality improve straight away basically because this throw area has been a lot smaller so therefore we have a lot more uh, shadow map uh, proportion to this teapot so there's a lot more detail going on however if we don't want that if we want if we still want a large throw what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to increase the shadow map size. Now, one thing to remember with this is this uh, shadow map allocation works in memory blocks. So this is normally in the power of two. Say for example, 32, 64, 128, 512, sorry, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, and so on. So if we go, for example, if by default it's set to 512, if we go to 513, it's using the same amount of memory as if we used a 1024 block of memory, 1024 sized image. So something to bear in mind. So if we just increase this to 1024, which is literally doubling the size of the shadow map. So if we just put that back to 512 and we'll re-render that as it was. So we've got this kind of gnarly uh, blotchy effect around here. So let's increase that to 1024 and render that out. It becomes a lot crisper. Now the problem is with that is that it might be too crisp. We may have got the right amount of diffusion around here. So it's, it's blurred correctly but the quality is a bit shit. So what we need to do is we need to, whatever we do with this value, we do with this value to get the same kind of effect, but obviously um, at a better quality or worse quality, depending on whether or not you want to go up or down the scale. Say, for example, if we want to put this up to 1024 and we want the same blurriness value, we need to double this value too. So that needs to go up to 8. So we've got a better quality 
with the same amount of blur. In contrast, if we put it back to 512 and back to 4, if we want to reduce the quality, say for example we've got an absolute ton of these lights in here and it's taken up a long time to render and we don't really need that kind of shadow detail, we can take this down to 256 and we can halve that as well. Same amount of blur but the shadow quality is now quite rubbish. Okay, in the next section, uh, I'm going to scoot over these two values here. Uh, we don't really need to worry about absolute map bias, but two-sided shadows are normally just enabled for um, if you've got two-sided objects. That's basically it, and that is very, very rare. Okay, the next section, atmosphere and effects, is literally for simply adding uh, volumetric lights, any other plugins, we've got final flares in, enabled here as well. Uh, and additional lens effects, like for example, uh, lens flares, that type of thing. So you can literally apply it by a simple one click instead of simply just going into the environment panel, adding a volume light, and then picking the light in question. So what we can do it's literally just add a volume light and it will put one in straight away and automatically assign it to it. Handy if you just want to do it with the odd one light, not so handy if you want to do it with multiple lights. Okay, I'm just going to delete that. And the, next, the last two rollouts are to do with mental ray uh, power. Say, for example, if you want to give it like a, uh, a larger energy or uh, an increased amount of um, uh, global illumination photons. Um, again, only apl applicable within the mental ray rendering engine. Okay, with that in mind, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through uh, the additional uh, light, uh, light type properties. So if I change this light type, if I change it now to directional, what that literally gives us is a change in light throw. Directional lights are normally used to simulate lights that are at a distance or at infinity, say for example the sun. They're not used for close proximity lights, for example uh, spotlights, overhead lights, kino tubes, stuff like that. Reason being is because they give a linear shadow. So if I just undo that, I'm just going to tighten that cone and I'm going to render out from the top viewport. Actually, it's a bad example. Let me just pull that in quite tight. Bring this in a little bit closer. And then render that out. We can see that the shadow is quite fanned out. Now, this gives a representation of a light at a close proximity. Now, the sun obviously is uh, quite a distance away, so any shadows that are cast on the ground in real life are obviously going to be a lot more linear. So therefore, what we need to do is we need to just change this light type to directional. So bearing in mind what we've got before, so let's just have a look at what we had before. So if I now click render, you'll notice that this shadow will change to a linear one. Obviously, we're going to have to increase the throw as well. Let's just increase the throw. So the shadow is now very, very straight and very linear, which is obviously just, if we view it through the light's POV, it's literally going straight down these sides here. Same properties, hotspot beam, full off field, everything else remains the same apart from um, the uh, apart from the uh, the actual light type okay next property to do next property to check is um, we can change the light to an omni now obviously by changing the light type this obviously keeps the uh, the light at the same rotational value as well so we might you might want to rotate this uh, around now the reason for this is the way that the lights are actually sorry shadows are actually emitted from this light type now what we had 
uh, previous to early incarnations of Max, sorry, early early versions of Max, is that uh, Omni lights never used to emit shadows. Um, now I think it was circa Max Two that we actually only got shadow casting Omni lights. Now the way they've actually done it is, or the way we used to do it, sorry, is by having six. I just quickly illustrate. Um, what we used to have is six, what we used to do is, is create six lights. So we had one um, Omni light going that way, one Omni light going that way, sorry, one uh, uh, spotlight going that way, one spotlight going that way, one spotlight going that way, one that way, one forward, and one the other side as well, so enabling six. So those throws were very, very tight. So we had very, very little gap between these edges of lights here, and then you obviously used to link them together to, to position them. Now, the Omni light in Max now works in the same principle. We have one shadow going that way, we have one shadow going that way, that way, that way, and then one that way, and one that way. So in essence, we have got six shadow maps. Now, this is uh, useful and uh, detrimental in the same in the same way reason being is they they can use a lot of memory if for example we only we're only illuminating the scene like this and let's reposition this light up there <coughs> and if i render that out we've only got one shadow we don't need the thing is though this light is actually still emanating and still calculating six shadows when we only need one so you only really need to use omni lights when you actually need to like for example if you're using them for fills uh to illuminate um problem areas harsh dark areas that kind of thing um you don't really need to use them um to illuminate an entire scene um for example um an external scene if you if you remember the uh, the skydome tutorial which we'll cover in a second um we don't need a, a large number of these omni lights situated around the scene like for example like this reason being is because we are going to be multiplying by six fold the amount of shadows that max needs to calculate which is going to it quite possibly will crash your computer um because of the the sheer amount of memory overhead required so if we do use Omni lights and they're only going to be subtle within the scene, you don't need the shadow map to be that high. So you may want to drop it down to 256, again, with a sample range uh, accordingly, whether or not you want it more diffused. Sample range is basically um, how blurry you want the shadow. So for example, you've got it at 512, you want the sample rate, you want, you want it to be... Um, uh, a lot more blurry so we might want to put it up to 10 or even 20 and that will give like a nice diffused blurry effect around here so if i scoot back to this i'll give you a quick example of that so by default it looks like that and we can diffuse the shadow even further still up to a maximum value of 50 it won't go any higher than 50 unfortunately okay um, that pretty much covers the basics of uh, the standard lights the only other ones that we have to get to uh, to work with by default uh, just get rid of this particular light so we're going back to a standard max illumination the only other ones that we mainly have is um, the main skylights. Now what that enables us to do, if I just quickly render that, it uses the basic ambient colors to, or the basic, sorry, diffuse colors to give like a, a global uh, illumination cast right across our scene. Now if you notice by default there aren't any shadows applied, and as soon as I click on cast shadows and click render, you'll notice that the entire thing grinds to a virtual halt. Reason being is because there are, it, it takes the CPU and the renderer a lot of time to calculate the shadows for 
even such a basic scene like this. So imagine if you've got a large complex architectural scene, how long it's actually going to take. So this is mainly used very, very frugally um, when you really necessarily need to use it or if you've got a large render that you can set going overnight or it's been done in multiple passes or multiple strips. You've got multiple machines working on the same image, for example. Um, what we can do is obviously drop the quality by simply amending this raised per sample value. Uh, Say so you can drop it down to a value of 10, which obviously you know pretty much half the render, or maybe even down to a quarter speed. Um, as before, the ray bias is uh, the distance between the shadow and the object. So obviously we can obviously simulate this thing floating on, you know, floating in the middle of nowhere if we really need to. Uh, one good thing that we can do with this particular light is that we can simulate, um, as we covered in the workshop, we basically went through high dynamic range imaging. We can actually drop a large panoramic image into this particular slot and use it to um, illuminate our scene uh, so it looks more realistic. It's a very, very handy little feature this but again use it use it very very sparingly now what we're going to um, concentrate on later on is we're going to try and simulate the exact type of diffused daylight effect but using the standard sky the standard um, standard lights within max using multiple direct lights situated around the scene as mentioned before so we've got this kind of ground plane object multiple lights in like a, a hemisphere effect so if we look on it from the top you've got the one object there and you've got multiple lights all pointing in at the center so we've got this nice kind of diffused shadow effect around the base kind of like simulating this effect around here okay so that covers the uh, the basics of lighting and the next thing that we'll do is we'll go through and try and simulate something with uh, the basic lighting features that we wouldn't natively be able to do and that being a standard area light <laughs>